So hi, everybody. Welcome to this Academy for Teachers Masterclass on Mathematics and Patterns with Manjul Bhargava. Um, so I'm Brooke Nixon Friedheim, uh, for people who weren't with me for the last eight minutes. And I'm in my 16th year of teaching. I teach at Long Island City High School. And um, I would say that my favorite thing about teaching is really just, you know, that moment when you can actually like feel your brain expanding when you learn something. And you can see that moment with a kid when their face lights up and they're posture changes, and you can really get that sense um, of, you know, the actual process happening. Um, and so, you know, I really also love being a fellow of the Academy of Teachers. We were talking about that at the beginning. This is probably my fourth or fifth masterclass. Um, and I love them so much because I really just do feel like they're an organization that allows teachers to find their passions, to engage in their passions, and really just return to their students as more inspired and um, cool individuals. Um, so today, I think, is going to be no exception for us here uh, in this masterclass. So I have the honor of introducing Manjul Bhargava. He's a professor of mathematics at Princeton, and he's the 2014 recipient of the Fields Medal, um, which is often referred to as the Nobel Prize of Mathematics, for his work in developing powerful new methods in the geometry of numbers. Um, he's also a very dedicated uh, and devoted educator and he recently co-authored a massive new education policy for the country of India um, you know so obviously his work goes beyond pure math um, and I also in some of my reading about him I saw that he uh, plays a pretty mean tabla um, so he'll tell us more about that maybe um, so I am excited to take this class because I really just see patterns and relationships as you know the most <laughs> fundamental thing to our uh, our experience as mathematics beings in the world. Um, when my daughter was, you know, really young and kind of getting that first sense of what careers are, she asked me what I did and math teacher didn't mean a whole lot to her at that point. Um, and so I changed it to say that I'm a patterns teacher. Um, and so that to me is really like that, that made immediate sense to her when she was two. Um, patterns, I feel like when you see them in the world, to me as sort of a non-religious person, they're a very spiritual thing. Like they help me feel like the universe makes sense. And, you know, that offers me a lot of comfort. Um, so I'm really thrilled today to be inspired by Manjul and his work, but he's not going to be the only star of this master class. We also have 26 teachers here, and they have advanced degrees in computer science, education, ethnomusicology, anthropology, science, film, physics, psychology, and math, and teach everywhere from K through 12 in early college in public schools, charter schools, and independent schools. Um, the whole range of classes is covered, the traditional high school sequence, but also animation, healthcare and inequity, technology integration, and patterns of geometry. Um, and they also continue to inspire students past the end of their day um, when advising clubs such as Mathletes, a math magazine called Radicals, the school musical, social justice anti-racism club, and Girl Scouts. People here have taught for between three and 40 years, which is impressive. Um, and the total number of teaching years that we have collectively is 464. We teach currently between 26 and 184 kids. So the number of kids who know our names this year alone is 2,362. Um, so your real audience today, Manjul, is, is all of those kids because we're all going to take uh, you know, the, the joy that we get out of class and take it back to them. So thank you very much, Professor Bar Bargava, uh, for being here today. And let's go ahead and get rolling. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's really an honor, uh, really an honor to be with you all. Uh, a big salute to the Academy for Teachers for the incredible work it does. But of course, uh, a big salute to all the, all you teachers who do so much for our next generation. Uh, you're our heroes, and it's just an honor, honor to be with you. Uh, I'll share my screen if that uh, works. Can everyone see that? Yeah, awesome. Uh, yeah, so what I wanted to talk about today, um, as, as many teachers mentioned in their statements, uh, patterns are what gets students excited and uh, it's what got me excited when I was growing up. Uh, I love looking for patterns around me and floor tiles in the sky, on trees. Uh, I enjoyed that more than I enjoyed uh, school math classes, to be honest. And that's why um, that's one of the reasons to give this talk is that I hope a lot of you, I know a lot of you already do this, but to bring some uh, discovery uh, to, uh, to the classrooms uh, can really, can really 
bring the excitement and the adventure of mathematics out. So what I want to talk about today is some of the patterns and numbers and natures that got, uh, that got me excited about mathematics when I was growing up. So this is a very, very personal story. Um, and I'll give a lot of personal examples of the, of the kind of things that got me excited uh, when I was growing up and what really got me into mathematics. Uh, so first of all, what is mathematics? Uh, I really think of mathematics in large part as the search uh, for patterns uh, and not just finding those patterns, but also for the explanations as to why those patterns exist. So mathematics is both the search for patterns as well as, um, as for the explanations of why those patterns exist. Uh, some people call those proofs, that tends to scare kids, but really all proofs mean, proof means is an explanation uh, of why. Uh, and when, once you find the pattern and you find its explanation, then those explanations can often then be used in applications well beyond the context in which they were first discovered. And it's when you understand those explanations that, that really helps propel humanity forward, uh, both uh, in terms of art and social science, but uh, also in terms of science and technology. Uh, so for example, the patterns and the motions of planets that humans uh, studied for, for really thousands of years uh, led to the theory of gravitation, eventually those patterns. Uh, that's the explanation, uh, allowing us to launch our own satellites, right? Uh, and then people saw patterns in genomes when we could start to, to do sequencing. And that's now helping in curing disease once you understand the explanations of those patterns. So patterns is really what drives mathematics and drives the applications of mathematics in our, in our, in our lives. Um, so that's the importance of patterns, but of course, when you're teaching kids, patterns are just fun. <laughs> they're artistic, uh, they're exciting, and they're mysterious until you understand them. And that is the excitement of mathematics. Uh, so the area that I work in personally is called number theory. So for number theorists, our natural world uh, is the universe of whole numbers. So what are whole numbers? By whole numbers, I just mean one, two, three, four, and so on, the counting numbers, but also zero, minus one, minus two, minus three. Uh, for number theorists, these are considered uh, the whole numbers, the integers. Uh, and for number theorists, like me, this is, our, this is our universe. We work in this universe. We try to solve equations in this universe. We try to understand properties of the, uh, of the elements in this universe. Uh, that's uh, what number theorists do. So number theory is the branch of mathematics that studies patterns uh, in the whole numbers. In the integers. Uh, so number sequences, just to give one uh, example of the kinds of patterns that number theory study, number, theory, number sequences are among the most basic types of patterns that mathematicians study and in particular number theorists study. And number sequences are among the best ways of uh, really getting into the heart uh, of a mathematical subject. Uh, they come up in topology, they come up in geometry, uh, but of course for number theorists they're very, very sacred, sacred objects that really tell you about our universe of all numbers. So examples of number sequences that you've all seen. By the way, please feel free to just speak anytime, ask any questions anytime, uh, interrupt anytime, or you can also ask questions in the chat, but uh, yeah, just interrupt anytime. Uh, and in particular, uh, feel free to holler out the answers and when I ask you what these sequences are. <laughs> uh, what is the sequence? One, 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 one. Everyone see the pattern there? I think so. That's just all one's sequence. <laughs> uh, this is actually the most common sequence in mathematics. It comes up everywhere. Uh, most people don't talk about it because it's too common and too easy. Uh, it's the all one's sequence. Uh, this is the sequence of counting numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The sequence of counting numbers. Uh, these are called the odd numbers. It's a sequence of odd numbers. Uh, they're complement, they're called the even numbers. And we all learn these in school. Uh, these, once, uh, now the sequence I start talking about now, sometimes when you start to ask school children, they actually don't know. They should. Uh, everyone should know these sequence of numbers. These are the square numbers, right? One times one, two times two, three times three, and so on. Uh, this sequence here, so one times one times one, two times two times two, right? And so on, three cubed, four cubed. These are called the cubes. These are all sequences that all all students should learn. Uh, 
up till now, all the sequences that we had were what are called polynomial growth. Uh, to know the difference between polynomial growth and exponential growth, it's always good to know the most fundamental exponential sequence, which is called the powers of two, right? Each time we double, one, two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, right? We're doubling each time. Uh, these are called the powers of two. And of course, another example of an exponential sequence is where you take every other element of that previous sequence, and those are the powers of four. Right? One, four, four times four, four times four times four, and so on. So these are called, uh, these are called the powers of four. So these are all typical kinds of sequences that we all um, learn in school and that uh, we all teach to our students. Uh, the one thing that never sort of makes it into the curriculum, we kind of just learn these, uh, there are a lot of relations among these sequences. And it's understanding those relations that really allows one to appreciate the beauty of mathematics, that unity, the fact that all these sequences are actually related to each other in, in some way. So one of my most favorite examples of a relation between two of these sequences that uh, most people in our population just don't know. And there are two fundamental sequences, they're related. Why does everyone not know this? I think they should. Uh, it's, just so, it's just so fundamental. So sometimes the sequences can be related to each other in surprising ways. They're fundamental and yet people don't realize they're related. Uh, and this is really fun to do with ISO. Sometimes when I do sessions with, um, with school kids, this is um, incredibly fun to do with them because everybody comes up with different ways of, of understanding why why these patterns are there. So, so here's the example. What happens when we take the odd numbers? So every, all students know what the odd numbers are. What happens when we start adding up the odd numbers, starting with one? So if you just take one, well, you only just get one. <laughs> but if you take one plus three, uh, what do you get? You get four. What if you take one plus three plus five, the first sum of the first three odd numbers? You get nine. But if you take one plus three plus five plus seven, uh, you add up the first four odd numbers. For that, you get 16. And so on. Uh, everyone see the pattern? Uh, how many people have seen this pattern before? Okay, that half of you. Uh, so in general, what this pattern is saying, if you have students sort of just look at this pattern, they'll be able to guess immediately that, okay, if you take the sum of the first n odd numbers, one plus three plus five, all the way up to two n minus one, you should get the nth square number, namely n squared. Uh, so that's what the pattern seems to be saying. Uh, but again, once you find the pattern, you wanna know, well, why is it true? Why does that happen? And will this happen forever? Uh, and there are, of course, many, many different ways of looking at this. So when, when you let students loose on this, on this problem, it's really fun because everybody comes up with different ways of understanding it. You can think of it in terms of algebra, and think of it in terms of induction. Uh, but uh, my preferred solution, of course, is to not have to write anything down and just be able to think about it and understand it. Uh, and the point is that a picture can explain, a picture can explain this. And, and that's the picture. So this picture actually explains why one plus three plus five plus seven if you keep adding those up up to a certain point, you'll just keep getting square numbers, right? And the reason for that is you take a square grid of dots. So this one has six on each side. So that's why the total number of dots here is six times six or 36, six squared. So there's six squared dots here, uh, but you can break up the square of dots into, by these L-shaped red lines here. And when you do that, the little uh, areas that they bound now, each has a successive number of odd numbers in it. So this, square, this uh, L here contains one dot, but then between these two Ls, there are three dots. And then between the next two Ls, there are five dots, you can see. And then this next L has seven dots. And this next L has nine dots, you can see. And the next one has 11 dots. And from that, you can just visually see that one plus three plus five, right? One plus three plus five plus seven, right? It's four squared. If you add nine now, you'll get five squared. And then if you add one plus three plus five plus seven plus nine plus 11, you'll get 36. So each time you add this next L, you get the next square number. 
as this clear visually. And so we can see six squared here is just the sum of the first six odd numbers. And that's really why that statement is true, that if you keep adding up odd numbers, you always get square numbers. And so that implies that if you take the sum of the first n odd, odd numbers, you get n squared. And this is the kind of proof, this is the kind of explanation that once you show it to students, or, once, or better yet, when, once a student discovers it for themselves, uh, you never forget this. You know this for the rest of your life, because this, this, this picture, once that's in your brain, you know this, you know this mathematical result. And if you prove it by induction, or all the other standard ways that often you learn how to do in school. Uh, very few people remember that for the rest of their lives. But this pictorial proof, you remember for the rest, rest of your life. Uh, so I never forgot this. I learned this when, uh, when I was in school. And never again can I ever forget it because it's just so beautiful. And it tells you the fundamental relation between two of the most basic sequences in mathematics, odd numbers and square numbers. So there are lots of examples like this and letting students loose on these kinds of examples to just start to visually be able to think about uh, mathematics pictorially, uh, I think is, is, a, is a really valuable thing. Um, it stayed with me uh, even until now. So this is called a proof without words. You don't need any words, you just make a picture and, uh, and you know the answer. So here's another example of such a relation uh, between sequences. If you, just take, uh, if you just take the regular counting numbers, and you count, say, one, two, three, four, up to a certain point, and then go back down three, two, one. Okay, and you add, and you add those numbers as you say them. Go up and then back down. So, say we start at one. Well, then you're done. So one is one. But suppose you go one plus two plus one. Okay, uh, so count up to two and then come back down, and you add those numbers. What do you get? You get four. What happens if you count up to three? One plus two plus three plus two plus one and add those up, what do you get? You get nine. What happens if you count up to four? One plus two plus three plus four plus three, plus, and then count back down plus three plus two plus one and add them all up, what do you get? Well, in that case, you get 16. And again, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a pattern. We're again getting the square numbers by just counting up and then counting down and adding up and getting the square numbers. Again, letting students loose on this, uh, they come up with beautiful answers, but again, you can say, well, can you, can you come up with a picture that explains it in the same way that we explained adding odd numbers at it adds up to square numbers. Uh, and so in general, you see the pattern, you count up to n, and then you count back down, add it all up. The conjecture is that that should be n squared. And the question is, uh, can you find a similar pictorial explanation? Uh, so think about that, uh, and then please have your students think about that. They come up with, uh, with beautiful, beautiful answers. Uh, and then if I just go back to the previous slide, instead of using odd numbers, uh, suppose we had added up even numbers. First even number, add the first two even numbers, add the first three even numbers. What's the pattern you see there? And then can you, can you make a picture that explains it? Uh, so there you don't even give them the answer. You just say, what is the pattern? And then find the find the reason uh, using a picture. Uh, so that's, that's another thing that, that's another variation of this that, that you can do with pictures. And it really unleashes the creativity of students to find pictures that explain, first finding the patterns and then finding pictures that explain the patterns. Uh, I wanna tell you my favorite problem as a child, uh, which was stacking oranges. So my, my family was a fan of juicing and we always had a lot of oranges in the house and my favorite use of the oranges was not in the juice, but it was in stacking them up <laughs> into pyramid shapes, <laughs> the same way that you see them at a grocer, right? When, when a grocer stores oranges, they actually store them in these, right? They, when you go to a grocer, you'll see these oranges in triangular pyramid shapes. Uh, the reason being that that's been proven recently that that is the tightest packing of spheres that you can possibly make. And so grocers have known that for a long time, but mathematicians now know that too. <laughs> uh, so my problem that I, got excited about is I would take all the oranges and I would stack them into a big triangular pyramid. And I wanted to understand, before I started making the pyramid, how many oranges would I need in order to make a pyramid with say, you know, five oranges on each side or N oranges on each side. So if each edge here, each edge here has uh, N oranges on each side, how many total oranges will I need so that 
uh, when I reach the very top and I put that last orange, which number orange will that be? Uh, I want to know in advance how many oranges do I need so that exactly it'll fit into a pyramid when, I, when I'm done. Uh, so in other words, how many oranges are in a triangular pyramid and oranges on each side? Uh, that was my, that was a question that, uh, that really excited me. I used to see this stacked this way in grocery stores and I wanted to, to reproduce those pyramids at home. And I wanted to know well, how many oranges are needed to make a pyramidal stack having n oranges on each side. And I remember this is the first math problem I ever solved that was kind of non-trivial. <laughs> um, and I was like eight or nine years old and I still worked on it. I thought about it for months <laughs> off and on. And when I finally understood the answer, uh, first I found the answer just by patterns, but when I really understood why that answer is true, that was like uh, a moment for me that, was, that I still remember uh, had a big impact on me wanting to just do more of that kind of thing. Uh, but it also made me appreciate um, the, the predictive power of mathematics, that once you know the answer to this, you can just use that formula to know how many oranges you need. And then when you just set aside that many oranges and then you start making a pyramid and that last orange when you're done just comes perfectly on top. Uh, that's a, it's an amazing moment. It just shows you the predictive power of mathematics. Uh, so here's the pattern. If you just have a one orange pyramid, you just get one, of course. But uh, can you imagine if you have two oranges on each side, how many oranges you'll need? So that's good to try and make students visualize. Can you, can you visualize that yourself, right? So you'll have three forming a triangle on the bottom, right? And then one will come fit right on top. Right? So to make a pyramid with two oranges on each side, um, you need four oranges. And now what is the next layer? Suppose you have that four and then you wanna make another layer below it. Well, you can see that that will need six oranges to make a bigger triangle, right? And then on top, we'll sit four more. So if you have three oranges on each side, um, you need uh, 10 total oranges, right? Uh, and it turns out if you have four oranges on each side to make a triangle pyramid, you're gonna need 20 oranges, and then 35, and then 56. Uh, if you have six oranges on each side, 84. If you have seven on each side, 120, if you have eight on each side, and so on. Uh, and the question is, uh, what is the pattern? And once you understand the pattern, can you see an explanation, just visual, uh, without having to do induction? Or uh, why is this the number of oranges? Uh, and what is the formula for the nth term? Um, so I'll tell you the answer, but please think about why it's true, just as just visually. Uh, but the answer is n times n plus one times n plus two divided by six. So for example, if we want to know this term, eight oranges on each side, you take eight times nine times 10, which is 720, you divide by six and you get 120. So I was just so fond of this formula because you just plug in a value of n and it just spits out the number of oranges you need and you take that many and it just you get to the last orange and it just fits right on top. That's very convincing about the predictive power of mathematics. Uh, and then I've, I've done this with students, uh, with school kids, and yeah, they, they love being able to just take the right number of oranges, to tell them this formula, they take that last orange after they built it up, and then that last orange just fits perfectly on top. It feels like a jigsaw, you've solved a jigsaw puzzle. Okay, so this was this is my favorite problem as a child. Uh, what's the most common number sequence in nature? Uh, I know a lot of teachers uh, teach this in uh, in class and talked about it in, in their statements. So it's a pleasure to talk about this here because this was actually one of the sequences that really inspired me growing up as well. So the sequence, one, two, three, five, eight, 13, 21, 34, and so on. So I know everyone's seen the sequence, but you may not have seen it in the same way that I did. Uh, so these are called the Virahanka Fibonacci numbers. Uh, after uh, Virahanka, who's sort of the first person to ever write about them, and then Fibonacci, of course, the first person to write about them in Europe uh, a few hundred years later. Uh, so Virahanka uh, was a poet, a Sanskrit poet. Uh, and I got to learn about this. I feel very lucky. Uh, my grandfather uh, was a Sanskrit scholar. And so a lot of what I learned about mathematics growing up was through what he taught me about the rhythms of Sanskrit poetry. Uh, and part of why I got interested in playing tabla as well, uh, but it's also why, uh, part of why I got interested in mathematics is I love learning about the mathematics of rhythm that these ancient Sanskrit poets used to write about. Uh, they used to write about uh, uh, meters and music and meters and poetry 
and they'd write about these meters in those meters. <laughs> so it was these, these acrobatic poems that had very deep mathematics inside. Uh, so Virahanka uh, was a poet around the year 700. And, and one of the poems that captured my imagination when I was studying with my grandfather, uh, Sanskrit, uh, Sanskrit poetry, was this poem, which I'm just translating for you. He has a poem that says, write down the numbers one and two. <laughs> and then each subsequent number you write, make it the sum of the previous two that you wrote down. This is the answer uh, to the following problem. And then he, he poses the problem, which I'll tell you. Uh, so Virhanka was a linguist. Uh, so it's kind of amazing that he's writing this kind of stuff. Uh, but he was a linguist interested in classifying uh, meters in poetry. So I first learned of these numbers uh, from my linguist grandfather as the Hemachandra numbers, named after another linguist, Hemachandra, who also lived before Fibonacci. Um, these numbers were also written about by another linguist that I studied with my grandfather named Gopala. Uh, of course, they're now known in India as the Fibonacci numbers, <laughs> after Fibonacci who lived after all three of these. <laughs> uh, so it's amazing, Fibonacci was not the first person to write about the Fibonacci numbers, in fact, not the second or the third. Uh, and I want to tell you why, so why were these ancient linguists studying these numbers? That's, that's really an amazing story and so cool. And it's helped me in my music playing and it's helped me in understanding mathematics. And, but what I, what I want to emphasize here is that these numbers were actually first discovered in human history by poets. <laughs> and I think that's just absolutely beautiful. It really shows the fine line between, between art and mathematics. So why were Sanskrit linguists interested in these numbers? So, well, to understand uh, why Sanskrit linguists became interested in these, uh, in these numbers, uh, one has to know a little bit about how Sanskrit poetry works. So Sanskrit poetry consists of syllables, each of which is either long or short. Uh, so this kind of dichotomy between uh, two kinds of syllables exists in many languages. Uh, usually it's called stressed and unstressed. Uh, you have stressed syllables and unstressed syllables in your poetry. But in Sanskrit, not only do you have the notion of stressed and unstressed, but you have a notion of long or short. Uh, and it's called long or short because long syllables are not just stressed, but they're actually pronounced longer than the short syllables for a longer duration. And what makes the setup of Sanskrit poetry so mathematical is that uh, long syllables are actually pronounced for exactly twice as long as short syllables. <laughs> so a long syllable lasts two beats of time when you're, when you're reading the poetry and a short syllable lasts one beat of time. And so Sanskrit poetry always sounds, uh, uh, sounds like um, this pattern of ones and twos. You hear the long and the, you hear the longs and the shorts um, uh, beats. You have two beats of time and one beat of time between each of those syllables. And so you can imagine that this would immediately create all sorts of interesting mathematical problems. And one problem that came up immediately for the poets in ancient times was, well, suppose I'm writing a poem and I have eight beats of poetry left, how many ways can I fill that in with longs and shorts, right? And if you have eight beats of poetry left and a long takes two beats and a uh, short takes one beat and you have eight beats left, how many ways can you fill it in? That's like, a, if you were a poet, this would be a natural, natural question that would just come up for you. So for example, so if you have eight beats left and a long takes two beats and a short takes one beat, you could do, right? You could do long, 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 right? That's eight beats right, because each long is two beats. But you could also do short, 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 and that would also be eight beats. But then you could do all sorts of things in between. You could do short, long, long, short, long. You could do long, long, short, short, long, right, and so on, right? So there are all sorts of things in between. And the question is, well, how many different things can you, can you do? If you have eight beats left, how many sequences of longs and shorts can you make so that you fill, uh, fill eight beats? Um, that's the question that uh, ancient linguists posed, uh, and that Virahanka solved in this um, poetry treatise that he wrote. Uh, and the answer, of course, is that you write down the sequence that Virahanka wrote on the previous page, that poem. You unwind what that poem says. That poem says that you write down the numbers one and two, and then each subsequent number you write down should be the sum of the previous two. So uh, one plus two is three, then two plus three is five, right? Then eight is three plus five. You know, five plus eight is 13 and so on. Uh, you keep writing uh, 
we keep writing the sum of the previous two numbers that you wrote down. And what Virahanka wrote is that the nth number that you write down will be the number of rhythms having eight beats consistent of longs and shorts. So if here, for our problem here, if you have eight beats and you want to fill them in with longs and shorts, you count the eighth number in the sequence, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and the answer is 34. Uh, and that's how, that's how these numbers first came up in history, was through this problem in poetry in the year 700 by uh, Virahanka. And again, the question is, okay, that's the pattern. And Virahanka wrote the answer. He also explained why this is, why uh, is this the, um, the num why is this the answer? And the explanation is even more beautiful than, than the answer. <laughs> uh, and his whole explanation, I'll just translate his poem for you what the explanation was, and you can uh, feel free to unwind it and then work it out with uh, your students as well. His explanation was for why this is the way you find the answer was that just note that every rhythm ends with either a long or short. Every rhythm of end beats ends with either a long or a short. That's the whole explanation. <laughs> and I can un unwind that for you just a little bit, right? So every end beat rhythm ends with either a long or a short. If it ends in a short, how many beats do you have left? N minus one. And so, and if you end in a long, and how many beats do you have left? N minus two. Therefore, the number of rhythms with N beats is the number of rhythms with N minus one beats plus the number of rhythms with N minus two beats. Okay, so I went through that very quickly, but think about that. Uh, very beautiful, uh, and very beautiful connection between art and mathematics. And actually the original way that the Virahanka Fibonacci numbers uh, came up in human history. Um, okay, so that's where they first came up in human history through art. But I just wanna, of course, point out that even before humans existed, nature and nature's art knew about these numbers, <laughs> uh, of course. Uh, so these are examples that you've probably all seen, but the number of petals on a daisy tends to be one of these Virahanka numbers, right? Uh, this is a daisy you can see has 13 petals. This is a daisy that has 21 petals. And one of my favorite all-time pictures is, is this one. <laughs> There's a whole garden of daisies. Uh, and if you count the petals on any one of these daisies, you find you get um, uh, 34 petals. And I know that because I actually <laughs> sat there and counted <laughs> on all these flowers. <laughs> Uh, each one of these has 34 petals, and it's kind of amazing because that 34 is the same 34 as the 34 number of rhythms having eight beats <laughs> with long and short syllables. And that is just mind blowing, the fact that it's the same sequence appears and uh, calculated by daisies before humans, <laughs> and then humans came along and came along and wanted to write poetry and came across the same sequence of numbers. That unity of mathematics is really what excites mathematicians and it's just, um, this is something so beautiful. And it's actually taken a long time for, for scientists and mathematicians together to understand why daisies came up across these numbers and why, why they like to have this number of petals. Um, it's, not, it's not a trivial uh, problem at all why daisies prefer to grow uh, petals in this number. Uh, but it has to do with, with the center of the flower. Uh, the seeds in the center of the flower grow in a spiral pattern and from those seeds sprout the petals. And the tightest packing of seeds uh, in a spiral pattern, uh, it turns out to be what's called the golden spiral. Uh, each, each time a new uh, seed sprouts, it has to turn a certain angle, an angle that's optimal to turn so that the, uh, the seeds are packed as tightly as possible. Uh, they have to turn at what's called the golden angle. And and that gives the tightest packing of seeds around. And if you go an integral number of times around in that tightest, uh, in that tightest pattern, uh, an integer number of times, it turns out each, for each successive integer um, uh, leads to the next successive uh, Virahanka number of uh, petals. So that's only recently been understood uh, why, you know, why that happens, but it's, it's very beautiful and it's, it's it's connected to the, the same problem in poetry. That's something that's very poetic about nature's art and human art. They lead to the same, the same answer.
Uh, of course, you've all seen uh, in pine cones also, if you count spirals in one direction or another, this is the same principle that the tightest way to pack seeds in spirals is through these golden spirals. And if you go an integral number of times around one way or the other, it turns out either way, uh, you'll always get one of these Wiederhanker Fibonacci numbers. So here you can see if you go around uh, counterclockwise, right, you see you get 13 uh, spirals going that way. But if you go the other way, it turns out you get eight spirals. And in general, on a pine cone, if you go one way and the other way, uh, you'll always get consecutive uh, Wiederhanker Fibonacci numbers. Um, so this is, a, this is an activity I actually do in my my math class here in Princeton is just to have people collect we have lots of pine cones here in the fall, collect one and draw on it with a marker. If you don't use a marker, you get lost very quickly. <laughs> but you just write on it with a marker and you can see almost always you get two consecutive beer hunker for the next years. Okay, so I wanna move on to what is considered the most beloved sequence for number theorists. Uh, Anyone have a guess for what those are? For a number theorist. Yeah, the primes, absolutely. Yeah, that's right, Ian. So most beloved number for, for number theorists, of course, the prime numbers, 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19, and so on. Uh, so these are the numbers that have no factors other than one and themselves, right? So you can't write 11 as 3 times 4 or anything. It's just 1 times 11. That's it. Uh, these are the prime numbers. And the prime numbers are so important for number theorists because uh, prime numbers are like the atoms of our universe, of whole numbers. Every whole number can be written uniquely, right, as the product of prime numbers. Every positive whole number can be expressed in a unique way by multiplying together prime numbers. And so just like atoms uh, combine together to make all the matter we have, uh, primes combine together to make all the numbers we have. Every whole number decomposes uniquely into prime numbers in a unique way. So for example, if you take 364, that's 2 times 2 times 7 times 13. That's the unique way in which it decomposes into prime numbers. And so when I was saying that whole numbers are the universe for us number theorists, the prime numbers are like our atoms. They are the, the basis for which all whole numbers are made. Uh, and number theorists have studied prime numbers for literally thousands of years. And it used to be thought that this is a, you know, a, something that's a purely human artistic interest. You know, they're just beautiful things that you use to study whole numbers, but they would never actually have anything to do with, um, uh, with our natural world, say. You know, it seems like a human creation. Uh, we like them. They, and we also, Number theorists always thought for centuries, millennia, that uh, this was purely there for the art of studying it. Uh, it would never have an application. Uh, there's a mathematician named, uh, named Hardy, famous number theorist, uh, who wrote a book called A Mathematician's Apology, in which he wrote how proud he was that he studied something, namely prime numbers, that could never possibly have an application. In particular, it could never have an application to war. It was just purely for the art of it. And um, he was very proud of that. Uh, he would be very upset to know what's happening nowadays. Uh, because prime numbers, uh, now we understand, are very useful for applications and also appear in nature. And I wanna, I wanna tell you that because these are fairly recent uh, developments uh, in our understanding. So first of all, prime numbers in nature. Uh, prime numbers are the fundamental objects in the world of whole numbers for number theorists. But it comes as a surprise even to number theorists that prime numbers also do arise in nature. And they arise because of a fallen creature that also existed well before humans who discovered prime numbers well before humans did. <laughs> uh, this creature, anyone recognize it? Is the, it's called the cicada. How many people have seen cicadas? <laughs> no? In Princeton we have, oh yeah, some people. In Princeton we have these uh, cicadas come out every uh, uh, oh yeah, only heard them Ian says. Yeah, they're very loud when they do come out. In Princeton, they come out, uh, we have a species here in Princeton, they come out once every 17 years. <laughs> and when they come out, they just completely flood the, <laughs> all the streets and yards and everything, and they're incredibly loud. Uh, 
and they come out, they mate for a while, and then they go back in and don't show up again for 17 years. <laughs> and they do that every 17 years. So I've only seen them once, uh, but it was they made quite a racket when they came out a few years ago. Uh, so these are cicadas. Uh, cicadas live underground, and they emerge only once every n years, where n tends to be a prime, like 13 or 17. <laughs> There's some cicadas that come out every 19 years. And there are even some cicadas that are known to come out every 23 years. So, but there are no cicadas that come out every 20 years or every 18 years or every 15 years, they just don't exist. And this is a big mystery for some, for a while, most people just thought, oh, well, it's just a coincidence that they just happen to come out every prime number of years for different primes, depending on the species. Uh, but uh, now that people have studied predator prey uh, models, they understand. So, so, I mean, the question always was, how did cicadas come upon prime numbers? <laughs> and uh, how are they so smart that they figured out what prime numbers are? And well, the hypothesis is that, well, they don't really know about prime numbers, but the hypothesis is that if, if n is a prime and they come out every n years, then it's least likely to be a multiple of the length of a predator's population cycle. So they arrange their population cycle to peak once every prime number of years. And if they do that, then they're least likely to coincide with the, with the peak of a predator cycle. Because if they did peak of the predator cycle, um, they might all be killed off and the species would die. Uh, so if they all come out at the same time and every prime number of years, and even they come out in such large numbers that even if a predator cycle does peak at that time, <laughs> Uh, there are just so many of them. So first of all, so that's why they do it in unison. Uh, but secondly, they do it in unison every prime number of years so that they're least likely to actually have that coincidence with a, with a, with a predator uh, peak. So, so okay, but how did, how did cicadas figure that out, <laughs> that they should come out every prime number of years? Well, the way they figured it out is the poor cicadas who came out every 12 years <laughs> would, would often coincide with the predator, with the predator uh, peaks, and they didn't make it. And the ones who made it till today are the ones that come out every prime number of years. Um, but anyway, that's, an, that's a beautiful application of, uh, uh, of how prime numbers come up in nature, um, discovered by, um, by cicadas. And I thought that was absolutely amazing. So they came out when I was a graduate student here at Princeton. And I was amazed that the, I came come here to study prime numbers and not knowing that I would be learning about prime numbers from the biologists here who study cicadas. Um, that's kind of, kind of amazing. Uh, now, what about prime numbers in everyday life? Uh, I'm sure many of you know this already, but I think it's very, very important for, for the, uh, very important for, no, I saw that comment about RIP composite cicadas, <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, yeah, poor, poor, prime, poor composite cicadas. Uh, so in modern times, prime numbers play uh, a huge role in our lives every day. And I think it's very important for the population to know this um, because every time we put, give our credit card number on the internet, right? Or we try to do anything securely, right? Online, prime numbers are playing a, a central role there. And so prime numbers are now, have now become so important in applications that it's become, you know, number theory has become the most heavily funded uh, branch of mathematics by our government because our national security now depends on prime numbers. Compared to what Hardy said, you know, 50 years ago that he was so proud to do, to be studying prime numbers because they would never have an application in their lives. And now they're like using everyone's life every day. <laughs> uh, and who would have predicted that? But they are now the most, they are so important to understand uh, for national security reasons, not just for the reasons of art that, uh, that number theory studied them for, for millennia. Uh, so the reason they, they come about every day in our lives is due to the following fact. So this is the fact that's used when you transmit your credit card on the internet to make your credit card uh, number secure when it's transmitted. Uh, suppose you have a 200 digit prime number. Turns out they're easy to, that those are easy to produce. You can easily produce 200 digit prime numbers uh, just by picking random numbers and testing if they're prime. They're very, they're about one in 200 chance that they'll be prime. Uh, so suppose you have two 200 digit prime numbers and I give those to you. Um, if you give them to your computer and ask your computer to multiply these two 200 digit numbers, your computer will give you the answer, the 400 digit answer in a fraction of a second. So 
give two 200 digit prime numbers to a computer and ask it to multiply them. In a fraction of a second, it'll give you immediately the resulting roughly 400 digit answer. But what if you now took that 400 digit answer, right? And gave it to, to another computer and asked it to find the original two 200 digit numbers. Remember we said that every number has a unique way of decomposing into prime numbers. So this 400 digit number has a unique way of decomposing into those two 200 digit prime numbers. And I'm just asking the computer to find it. So do the reverse process. If we multiply them, the computer could do it in a fraction of a second. If you ask it to do the opposite, if you take that 400 digit number, find its two 200 digit parts. Uh, turns out that the best known algorithms working on every single computer in the world for the next billion years <laughs> uh, will not be able to find the original two 200 digit parts. So this is crazy. So if we live in a world where we can take two 200 digit numbers and just multiply them in a fraction of a second. But if we give, if we ask a computer to do the reverse process, um, it'll take billions of years, even if we use every computer in the world. Uh, this is one of the major problems of number theory, how to do the reverse of multiplication and still unsolved. And because it's unsolved, uh, governments around the world, including the US government, presumably, um, because it does fund uh, prime number research very heavily, governments use this fact to, uh, and of course, all internet companies, Microsoft, everybody uses this fact to, um, uh, to carry out secure communications. So this is what's called a one-way function. You can, uh, if you know the two 200, they use this 400 digit number to, uh, to encode messages in a way that you can only decode them if you know the, those original two 200 digit numbers. So this is called public cryptography. You on your website can make two 200 digit numbers publicly available and people, uh, you can, sorry, you can make this 400 digit number publicly available uh, after you made them by your secret 200 digit numbers. <laughs> And people can encode using the 400 digit answer in a way that only you can decode it because you're the only one who knows these two 200 digit numbers. And we assume that nobody else in the world knows how to find them if they know this 400 digit answer. And that's why we have secure communications, presumably. Uh, I want to emphasize that I said the best known algorithms. Uh, number theorists actually have not shown that it's impossible to go backwards. They just don't know how to do it. <laughs> uh, but it's completely possible that uh, there's some government out there that know, that secretly knows how to do the reverse and is reading all our messages. That's completely possible. And that's why this branch of mathematics is so heavily funded because they are funding number theorists to find out either to prove that it's impossible to go backwards, in which case we'll know that our method of communication is secure, or to find, find the way of going backwards so that we stop using this insecure system. <laughs> uh, so this is, a, this is a very important problem in number theory, the problem of whether you can go backwards. It's completely unsolved. It's not known whether it's impossible. It's not known whether it's possible. And so it's a little spooky, the fact that we use this every day for our secure communications, but we have, we have no proof that it's secure. Yeah. But this is one, uh, one major way in which prime numbers enter our lives um, every day, is the way we communicate digitally. So this is the basis of much of the world's encryption that we don't know the reverse process of multiplication, but this is what uh, the inter, uh, internet uses. And since no one knows how to factor numbers, in other words, do the opposite of multiplication, or so we think that nobody knows, uh, this method of encryption is presumably secure. And so this is what I just mentioned. One of the fundamental problems in number theory is either to prove that it's difficult to go backwards and factor, or to find a quick way to factor thereby making all these encryption systems like RSA uh, useless. Um, and that's why number theory is such a heavily funded branch of mathematics now when it used to be thought that it's just a purely human artistic activity that has no application. Uh, but this is really a reason for studying pure science is that you never know when it'll become applied and become so, so important in applications, you never know. Um, beautiful science, beautiful mathematics always makes its way into applications sometime or other. Um, so yeah, one can never really think of any math fact that's useless. <laughs> and this is like one of the best examples of that. Where people thought it was useless for thousands of years and still worked on it. And now it's like so fundamental in our, in our daily lives and technology. Um, 
Okay, I want to mention one of my other favorite numbers uh, from childhood. Uh, so this is a really, uh, uh, how many people have seen this number? And this one is, is rare for people to have seen, but I think it's just like one of the most awesome numbers. One of my favorite uh, numbers to play with as a child was 142,857. <laughs> uh, I don't remember where I learned it, but it always had a huge influence on me and it's very connected to number theory. But as you can tell this to children and they will play with it for, for hours <laughs> sometimes uh, because it's so intriguing. The reason is, uh, the special property of this number is that if you take 142,857 and multiply it by one, you get 142,857 back. Okay, that might not sound that surprising, <laughs> but what's, what is surprising is that suppose you take 142,857 and multiply it by two, you still get 142,857 back. Just the digits are written in a different order. They just cycled around like one, four, two, eight, five, seven. So you started with one, four, two, eight, five, seven, you multiply by two, and you still get one, four, two, eight, five, seven. Okay, what happens if you multiply by three? Now look at that. You still get one, four, two, eight, five, seven. One, four, two, eight, five, seven. The digits just cycled around. What happens if you multiply by four? Look at that, you still get one, four, two, eight, five, seven back. One, four, two, eight, five, seven. And what happens if you multiply it by five? Now look at that, you still get it back. One, four, two, eight, five, seven. And what happens if you multiply it by six? Oh, and you get it back again. <laughs> one, four, two, eight, five, seven. So what you notice here is that when we multiplied one, four, two, eight, five, seven, the six digit number, right, by any number between one and six, you just got the same number back, but just in one of its cyclic, just, it just the digits just cycled around in one of the possible six ways that it can. And the six possible ways that you can cycle around the digits all appeared on this side when you multiplied uh, the starting number by one, four, one, two, three, four, five, or six. So there's six possible cyclic permutations of the digits, and you got them all just by multiplying by the numbers one through six. Isn't that amazing? I think that makes it one of the most amazing numbers ever. Uh, where does it come from? What is the theory of this? What is the explanation? Why does such a number exist? Uh, that's also a really fun uh, activity to, to do with students, I think, um, to understand why this is happening. Um, and it's not easy uh, to understand why it's happening. There's a lot of deep mathematics in here, but certainly just being able to show the art of this number without even understanding it is already um, yeah, it brings wonder uh, to, to kids' eyes. Uh, so there are lots of questions here. For example, are there other, so it turns out this is the unique six digit number that does that. Turns out there are no two digit numbers, three digit numbers, four digit numbers, or five digit numbers <laughs> that do this. Uh, there is a one digit number, <laughs> of course, that if you multiply all, by all the numbers between one and one, you just get the same <laughs> number back, right? Can any one digit number will work for that? But then there are no two, three, four, or five digit numbers that do this. But then there's one six digit number, and it's this. That's why it's special. So this is really the smallest such number out there. But we can ask, are there other such n digit numbers? Uh, such that if you multiply by one through n, uh, the number just cycles around in all n possible ways that it can. What would people guess? Uh, how many people think, yes, there are other such numbers? Okay, let's see about half of you. <laughs> How many think no? <laughs> this is the unique such number. Okay, fewer people think that. Uh, well, the answer is yes, there are other such numbers. Uh, <laughs> the next number is a 16 digit number. <laughs> um, it does start with a zero, it always will have to start with a zero after this. But if you take this 16 digit number and you multiply it by any number between one and 16, this number, you'll just get the same number back cycled around. And so, and that is the next, that is the next smallest number that has this, this, uh, this property. Uh, the next question that you might ask is, are there infinitely many such numbers, right? Uh, can you get bigger and bigger numbers of this kind? Uh, and this gets us right to the edge of what's known. Uh, this is an unsolved problem. We don't know if there are infinitely such numbers, infinitely many such numbers or not. Uh, maybe these numbers just stop after a while, or maybe they go on forever. Uh, we have no idea. Uh, but what's kind of amazing is that this connects to uh, one of the deepest 
number three problems uh, in the world. Uh, so there's a conjecture called Artin's conjecture, which if it's true, uh, would imply that there are infinitely many such numbers. Most people believe Artin's conjecture, so most people believe that there are infinitely many such numbers. And Artin's conjecture would follow from uh, probably the most famous problem in mathematics called the Riemann hypothesis. So Riemann hypothesis is one of the problems that uh, mathematicians have been trying to solve for, for decades. It's one of the things I think about now. I just find it amazing that this, this, this little number that I used to play around with when I was a kid um, brings me to the edge of what I know now in my field. And, and one of the fundamental problems in my field would imply that there are infinite many such numbers. I mean, it's just that really came full circle in a way that I never expected thinking about uh, this, this simple problem when I was a kid. Uh, again, it really shows that no mathematics is too trivial, no mathematics is useless. It turns out this is connected to some of the major issues in number theory involving prime numbers um, and involving Arden's conjecture involving the Riemann hypothesis. Um, but this is just like a little toy uh, that leads into to deep mathematics in, in the future. So as some of you observed in the, uh, in the chat, uh, where this number does come from, of course, this is the repeating pattern of one seventh. Right? If you take one seventh and you write it out in decimal, uh, you get 0.142857142857157 forever. Uh, and if you write down this number here, this number comes from taking one divided by 17 and taking its repeating pattern. One over 17 in decimal is 0 0.0588235, dot, 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 so on. This pattern repeated forever after the decimal point. Uh, one can prove that you'll always produce such a number by taking one divided by a prime number. But not all prime numbers work, and the question is, which prime numbers do? Um, and that's what starts to lead into the deep issues of, of number theory. Um, so speaking of these repeating patterns, this is, I mean, when you can really think of this uh, as a fractal. When you take one-seventh, one-seventh is 142,857, right, divided by uh, uh, divided by 10 to the 7, right, as we saw before. Uh, and then you have to add to that uh, another 142,857, but divided by 10 to the 14, and so on, right? You do this forever. It's kind of, uh, it's kind of number theoretic fractal. And that's why number theorists also get interested in fractals. Uh, so it's, it's the phenomenon called self-similarity. That was a number theoretic example of self-similarity. Uh, but a self-similar object or fractal is one that exhibits the same shape as itself at smaller and smaller scales. So you can see that happening with one seventh and its repeating pattern, right? You see one, four, two, eight, five, seven at smaller and smaller scales as you, uh, as you go past the decimal point further and further. Uh, but of course, the most common place where uh, the general public sees fractals, uh, of which one, four, two, eight, five, seven was an example, for, but for some reason, that's not as well known in the general population. I think it should be. Uh, but of course, we see fractals all through uh, geometry and all through nature. One of the most beautiful examples in everyday life of a fractal is what's called the fern. Right? So here you see a leaf uh, of the fern. And on this leaf are subleaves. And if you look at each of these subleaves, they look exactly like a copy of the fern itself, but at a smaller scale. Right? They're exactly the same shape. And if you look at the subleaf, you'll see that it has sub subleaves that also look like the fern, <laughs> just at an even smaller scale. And if you look at that sub subleaf, you'll see little sub sub subleaves on it that are of the same shape, and so on. Uh, and that that's what makes the fern a fractal. You're seeing the fern over and over again at smaller and smaller scales. Um, so that's what the, that's what a fractal is, and we see them all around nature and all around our lives. Uh, similar phenomena occur in snowflakes. If you ever looked at a snowflake closely under a microscope, you can see that each of the six uh, things that are coming out of the snowflake has sub things that look just like the thing <laughs> and so on. Uh, leaves, many leaves have fractal patterns, clouds, coastlines, mountains, lightning. If you've ever seen lightning, you see, you see the zigzags, but the zigzags have little zigzags coming out of it that are smaller uh, and so on. So these are, these are called fractals. Uh, they exist in number theory, they exist in geometry, they exist in topology, they exist uh, throughout mathematics. Uh, and they always tell you things when you find them. Uh, of course, man-made art always um, 
use fractals for their, for their beauty. Uh, this is uh, a famous temple in Madhya Pradesh in India where you have a big temple. And in that big temple, you have these little sub temples <laughs> that look just like the original big temple. And on, you can't really see it here, but uh, on the sub temple, you have these little sub sub temples that look just like the original big temple uh, and so on. And they do that for a few iterations. So that really, really looks like a fractal. Uh, lots of cultures uh, discovered fractals in their art. Uh, this, is a call, this is a Fulani uh, wedding blanket from Nigeria. This is always made in the shape of a diamond. And on the diamond are various diamonds and the diamonds you can see have, have sub diamonds and those diamonds have sub sub diamonds and sub 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 diamonds and so on. Um, so you have little copies of the whole big blanket inside uh, on smaller scales. Uh, one of the most famous artists that used fractals regularly was Escher. Uh, this is Escher's smaller and smaller. He made it very clear that he was taking the same thing and making it smaller and smaller. But each of these lizards that you see, I repeat again on smaller and smaller scales, but not just that, entire patterns of lizards. If you see sort of this pattern of lizards, this kind of, you, know, you, see this, you see this big pattern of lizards out here. And inside it, you see that the exact same pattern is right inside here. So basically, if you took this big part of it and you shrunk it, you would get exactly this forever on in, to infinity. And then you have another copy right in here, you can see, right? You can see another copy of that right in here, and so on. Uh, so this is one of these beautiful Escher paintings called Smaller and Smaller, which is literally a fractal. Uh, it has lots of copies of itself on smaller and smaller scales. So I just want to end by, um, by saying how important it is for for us and for students to look for the, all the patterns around us. This is one of my favorite stories at Princeton uh, where I'm a member of a co-op here where they, they every, uh, every week they get their big pile of vegetables and they get to cook them as a co-op. Uh, but one week this vegetable came in the, in the package, fractal, uh, fractal broccoli it's called. <laughs> Uh, Romanesco broccoli sometimes, but it's, yeah, uh, fractal broccoli. Uh, this whole big broccoli, you can see copies of itself sticking out of it. Look at this. <laughs> and then on in that, there are little copies of, of that little thing on top of it and so on. Uh, when my students uh, saw this at the, at the co-op, they couldn't get themselves to, uh, to cut it up and cook it because they were like, oh my God, this pattern is so beautiful. And so instead they put it, they placed it on the center table as the centerpiece. <laughs> for as long as it didn't rot. <laughs> and it was the topic of conversation for weeks <laughs> uh, about fractals, because I was talking about fractals in my class. And there were lots of people from my class in the co-op. And I know that's the kind of thing that makes the teacher so proud to see that their students are noticing patterns in their, in their life, in their co-op. Because this, this broccoli had an application, uh, namely uh, dinner. <laughs> and they chose not to use that application. They chose to admire the beauty and art of it and the mathematics of it. And I think that's very cool. So yeah, so I just want to end by saying, yeah, encourage your students, everyone, we should all be looking for all the patterns all around us, understand why they're there, because they're definitely there. And there's a lot to learn, a lot to learn from it. Um, so, okay, well, I'll stop there. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, for hanging out. And I'm happy to stick around for a few minutes if you want to ask questions in person. Uh, you can also look at uh, chat questions, but I guess I prefer if people just, uh, just look up. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, it's 517, so I recognize that some of you may need to go, but I would encourage those of you who'd like to stay and ask a few questions to please do so. Yeah, absolutely. There's some beautiful, I'm just looking at the chat, there are some beautiful card tricks based on 142857. Uh, they're card tricks, they're magic tricks that are, so every magician actually knows that number. Um, they make it come up in a randomly, random seeming way, but then they're able to do that multiplication in their head because of that, that special property. So there are lots of beautiful illusions based on that. Yeah. yeah, any other questions? Absolutely, I'm happy to. Um, this is Ian. Thank hey. you so much for your presentation. Um, I'm someone who doesn't come from, like I'm, I'm an English teacher and I, I've started teaching computer science and I'm someone who's always wanted to know more math than I do. I've got a big stack of 
admittedly, you know, somewhat difficult bedtime reading next to the, you know, number theory books and things like that. It's hard to concentrate in the evening when you're just falling asleep. But do you have any recommendations for further reading on these topics? Yeah, one of the best reading on these kinds of topics is Martin Gardner. Uh, uh, Martin Gardner had this amazing column in the Scientific American uh, for many, many years. And his, um, his columns have now been turned into books. Uh, so the name is Martin Gardner. I'll just type it in, uh, in the chat. I've, I've heard of him. I mean, he, he occupied a similar place in popularizing math that Carl Sagan did for astronomy, right? Right, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So the spelling is Martin, uh, G-A-R-D-N-E-R, uh, last name. Uh, yeah, highly recommend him. Uh, beautiful stuff. Uh, he also has an article about how to use 142857 in magic, <laughs> uh, also in one of his books. Yeah. Those numbers are called cyclic numbers, by the way, in case you want to look them up. Thank you again. Um, and, and one percussionist to another, I had a question about your experience playing tabla and and uh, being a mathematician. I don't think that these two things are separated from each other. Um, you also see, I know tabla, for example, is uh, is, a, is is written and performed orally as well. Right, right. Um, and it, such as also some of the drum traditions in Ghana um, and Awe drumming where, you know, you can say the prayer and you can also play it. Um, it has the same exact translation. And so I'm wondering, in your opinion, um, do you see these people um, and yourself as poets, as musicians, as mathematicians? Do you see them as separate? Yeah, no, all of the above. I see them as all of the above. Uh, what kind of uh, percussion do you play, by the way? I'm a Latin percussionist. Oh, really? That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of the tabla uh, drumming tradition uh, actually comes from Sanskrit poetry. So a lot because uh, one often had to accompany those poets uh, when they were singing their poetry. And they would play, for example, in the rhythms that I was talking about before, where you have this dichotomy between long and short, like you do in tango also. And so a lot of the repertoire was developed around the poetry. And that's why everything we play on the tabla can also be sung, as you were saying, uh, because it all did come from poetry. So um, since I don't have tablas in front of me now, I can just sing some a composition that I'm thinking. And I was able to convey a rhythm to you without having to play on a percussion instrument because they've been so, the prayers and the, and the poetry have been so tied together with the mathematics and the, and the actual physical playing of it was not even needed. <laughs> But that is the physical manifestation that comes that comes later. That there's a whole theory of math and poetry and prayer that comes even before you even you know hit anything <laughs> physically. Yeah. So yeah, all of the above percussionists are poets. They're um, they're mathematicians um, and they're musicians, of course. Thank yeah, you. Really very good question. Um, I have a quick question. I so I do a lot of um like I, I attempt to anyways, connect what we're doing in our geometry classes to what students might see in their uh, like immediate world around them in the Bronx. So I know that pattern finding activates some part of the brain. I'm not sure which one it sort mm. of, you know, spurs into action, but is, is it a type of pattern finding when students like learn something in the classroom then get a photograph of like their neighborhood and then they look for that thing they learned in class in their neighborhood? Or is that just like, you know, like application to the real world or is that considered a type of pattern finding? Is that activating the same part of their brain? I um, think so, yeah. I think it's looking for connections. Uh, yeah, so is that considered pattern finding? I, I, I looking for connections is also like pattern recognition, pattern finding, yeah. So if I learned something over here. Is there a connection to something over there? Uh, it might not be exactly the same thing, but it might be something related. And I think part, uh, when people talk about which part of the brain is that, I think it's all parts of the brain. Like, uh, you know, we often talk about artistic side of the brain and the analytical side of the brain. Pattern finding is one of those things that is both. <laughs> there is, first of all, the artistic aspect, you know, looking for, you know, Pat, you know, patterns are all about art and just looking for this beautiful thing here and is also over there. 
but then it's also analytical. You know, can I take the shape and fit it over there? Uh, right. uh, so it activates both of those sides. And that's why I think it's so important for both artists and you know, both, but for developing both sides of the brain and all, all students, both on the artistic side and the analytical side. Uh, but yeah, finding patterns in one place and also finding connections between different areas. Uh, you know, this, this is ingenious that we took prime numbers and could apply it to security. I mean, that is, um, that's a way of finding a connection that was completely unexpected. But when, you know, River Shimur and Edelman came up with that idea, it's now become so, um, that connection is just so obvious and beautiful uh, now to people, but it was very non-obvious. And uh, that's a lot of how science is driven forward, is to find those connections between seemingly unrelated subjects. Thank you. Yeah. So I, I had a question. Um, it, it, the minute you, you, you talked about when you were stacking oranges, how you, there's that joy of placing the last orange on top, which is really the joy of like, you know, discovering a solution that's integer. And when you show the equation that leads to it, um, the first thing I thought was that's a cubic divided by six, and that's guaranteed to be an integer for any mm. value of n. Right. Um, and one of the things that I really love about teaching math is seeing the connection between the geometry and the code, between right. the picture and the, the language. Right. So um, the picture for that is clear. There's the pyramid. It's got to be an integer. Right. The, the code behind that, is that trivial? Like to show that that expression must come to an integer? Is that like something that you would do early on? Or is that like heavy lifting? Like No, no, it's not heavy lifting at all. And it's also... Okay. It's also a follow-up question that I love to ask once people have seen that's an integer. You know, and I'm like, okay, well, suppose you didn't know the pyramid interpretation. Then how, how would you, what's an explanation that this is always an integer? And that always leads to, uh, to wonderful uh, lines of thought as well. Uh, so I can tell you what it is in that case. We have okay. n times n plus one times n plus two divided by six. Why is okay. that always a whole number? Well. Uh, for that, we need to know that n times n plus one times n plus two is always an even number so that we can divide it by two. And we okay. also know that it's always a multiple of three so that we can divide it by three. And if we know that it's both even and a multiple of three, then we can divide it by six. Why is it even? Well, because if n is even, then we're done. <laughs> okay. And if n is odd, then n plus one is even. And so we're done. <laughs> so I that's got why it. We can divide it by two, right? That's why n times n plus one is always divisible by two. Uh, okay. And then the same reasoning for why n times n plus one times n plus two is always divisible by three, because one of n or n plus one or n plus two <laughs> will have to be divisible by three, right? Because every third number is always a multiple of three. So one of those three guys will have to be divisible by three. That's why you can divide it by three. And that's why we could divide it by two. That's why we could therefore divide it by six. Yeah. Makes, makes perfect sense. <laughs> <laughs> very cool, very cool. Yeah, it's very cool. So it's kind of, it's, but I love that you pointed out that there are a lot of other things that once you've found the answer, that answer leads to questions. Wait, why is this thing always a whole number? <laughs> that's weird. We have an interpretation, right. that's one reason, but what is the reason? You know, the number theory reason. Yeah. Great question. I just wanted to say thank you for kind of highlighting the, the piece around historical erasure in terms of Fibonacci and the way that Fibonacci is talked about as mm. something that we just assume some Italian dude um, came up with right. having a dream about rabbits <laughs> reproducing or something. Um, and I, that, that's something that um, talking about connections, the class that I teach is called creative connections. Mm. And so all of the units that we study are completely different. Some of them are the intersections of art and history or art and activism or art and science or art and math, art and ecology, et cetera. Um, and so I really like to be able to, to draw that connection, but I didn't know um, the names of uh, the Indian mathematicians and poets who had been, who were responsible for that work. And so um, first, just thank you for that, because I had been digging and was coming up with just sort of these vague sentences, mm -hmm. um, just kind of acknowledging that, but not, not actually um, uh, naming names. And my question is just whether you have... Um, any sources that you might point me to, to, to find more information um, that I can share with my kids? Um, I'm, yeah, so yeah, thanks for that question. You're, you're very right. Um, and the erasure goes to a huge extent in the sense that even Indian textbooks call them Fibonacci numbers. <laughs> so that's the extent of the mm -hmm. colonial influence that not only are, are we here doing that, but 
you know, even in the country that was colonized, they have not gone back and changed <laughs> to what really happened. And, and you're right, the Fibonacci story, uh, where you had a dream about rabbits, that that rabbit model is something that is not based in reality at all. <laughs> it's a very incestuous story where brothers and sisters are mating <laughs> and it has nothing to do with reality. And then here we have the actual history of the Fibonacci numbers with the Virahanka numbers, where they actually, that's where it actually came up and it had a real application to poetry. I mean, what could be a better story than that? And why has that been erased? It's kind of amazing. Uh, and unfortunately, no, there aren't that many references because even Indian mathematicians do not uh, uh, do not use uh, do not use that history. Uh, the people who do use that history are the Sanskrit poets, and so that's where they're called the Virahanka numbers. The Sanskrit poets call it that, but unfortunately, they write mostly in Sanskrit. Uh, so I feel lucky that I got to learn about that because my grandfather was a Sanskrit scholar, and I could learn with him. But I had an interest in mathematics. So the way I'm going about it now is I, I think I'm going to write a book <laughs> where I carry out these translations because that translation has never been done. Uh, and since I learned, uh, in ah, you've my got those. yes, different. thank you. Uh, I hope to, yeah. So I hope to work on that over the next some years. Uh, but maybe I'll, uh, uh, I can send you some references if you just send me an email uh, that are still okay. a little bit cryptic. But eventually, hopefully, I'll have a more lengthy write up with translations and everything so that we can we can learn it properly and in a more fun way yeah <laughs> absolutely awesome. yeah thank you thank you that. so much we are in the very sad position that we're at 5 30 and i suspect we should wrap up the conversation however i do want to say i think there was a terrible mistake in the calendar that really this was supposed to last for several more hours <laughs>